going to talk about the risk and return of individual securities. So when we talk about securities, what are we talking about? We're talking about stocks, we're talking about bonds, we're talking about any sort of financial asset. Let's talk about returns. So there are two forms of returns you get from your securities. First of all, we could be looking for a series of payments. When you purchase a bond, you're looking for a series of bond coupons, which represent the interest payments on the bonds. And if you purchase stock, it's not required, but you might be buying that stock for dividends. For example, my dad only buys stocks that have dividends. What do you think uh, an 80-year-old, 81 now, what do you think an 81-year-old man would be interested in stocks that pay dividends? Why, why do you think I'm not interested in stocks that pay dividends? He's more concerned about cash flow. Yeah, he's more concerned about cash flow. He wants to have money to spend on whatever it is 81-year-old men spend money on. And uh, he's not really concerned about too much about capital gains, right? At my point in life, I would rather have capital gains because if those dividends hit, then I've got to pay taxes on them. But unless I sell stuff out of my portfolio, I don't have to worry about capital gains tax until I actually get around to selling them. And the way that I'm going, I can't remember the last time I actually sold stock, right? So my capital gains are mm, zero. So right now I'm sitting on a bunch of capital gains that I have yet to, what they say, realize. In other words, I haven't sold a stock and received that gain. Okay, so those are the two ways that we see returns. And so for the purposes of this discussion, we are going to talk about stocks and we will talk about dividends and capital gains from stocks. And there are a couple ways to think about returns. First of all, dollar returns. This is the total number of dollars you receive for making your investment. And so let's talk about, uh, let's say, 100 shares of a mythical company with $37 a share. The stock pays an annual dividend of $1.85 per share. Now note that we always assume in finance that cash flows occur at the end of the year unless we are told otherwise. And so we're assuming that we're doing this on day one and we're receiving that dividend on day 365. And at the end of the year, on that same day, the stock is selling for $40.33. And the question is, what is your dollar return on the stock investment for the year? That return's coming from two places. Can anybody tell me what they are? Or just one of them. One of them's real simple. Come on, we just got you talking about the 81-year-old man. What did he want? Uh, from dividends, right? And so in this case, you're receiving $1.85 per share in dividends. So You've got 100 shares, $1.85 times 100 is how much? Oh my goodness, you have to use your calculator for that. That's sad. What is it? Miss Hip? 185. 185, if you've got the answer, shout it out, please. <laughs> she had the, I've got the answer look in her eyes. Okay, so it's $185 per, uh, per overall from dividends. Now, What's the other source of gain? Capital gain. Yeah, the capital gain. We went from 37 up to 40, 33. So what we're gonna do is take $40.33 minus the 37. That gives us $3.33. What's $3.33 times 100? 333. And so our total dollar returns from this is going to be $518. That's just what you get from adding those two things together. And we're going to see this over and over again, that total returns are always about um, adding what you get from the dividends with what you get from the capital gains, whether we're talking in dollars like we are here or in percentages. So here's the problem. What's the problem with stating returns in this manner? What piece of information are we ignoring? Any ideas? If I just tell you, so you and I are at the cocktail party. I'm hanging out by the fish tank. You come over, you say, Dr. Haggard has the portfolio. I said, whoop, 
Today I had total returns of $518. Do you know whether to be impressed or not? No. What are you, what, what would you need to know to know whether to be impressed? Okay, so what kind of return? Like the ROI. The percentage, right? Yeah, so what you're missing here is how much was my initial investment? If I say to you that I got this kind of dollar return over a year on an investment of $1,000, are you impressed? I would think so, 51.8%, right? But what if I told you that I had this sort of uh, return on $1 million, that I got $518 over the course of the year off of a million bucks? Would you be impressed? No, you shouldn't be. You, you say, wow, what an idiot. I could have done better with my savings account, even as paltry as those returns are. And so that's the problem with dollar returns. We don't know how much you had to invest in order to get those dollar returns. Okay, so let's talk about the other way that we tend to talk, and this is more common to talk about percentage returns. Percentage returns uh, is just a percent of what you had invested at time zero. And so we've got two forms of these percentage returns. We have the one from dividends, which we call dividend yield. Dividend yield. And I know it looks a little funky with the subscripts, but here's all this means. Dividend at the end of the period divided by the price at the beginning of that same period. So T plus one is the end of the period or the beginning of the next period. And T is just the beginning of the period. So that's what we're talking about. And you can think of it this way. How much dividend will I receive at the end of the year for having invested this much money at the beginning of the year? Because that's how investment works. You're making money now in exchange for your, you're investing money now in exchange for future returns. Okay, the percentage returns for capital gains is called uh, capital gains yield. And it's a little more complex. We have to take the price at the end of the period subtract the price at the beginning of the period and divide by the price at the beginning of the period. The way that people typically screw this up is by dividing by the price at the end of the period, but that's wrong because that does not represent what we've had to invest in order to get the capital gain. And we can get our total percentage return simply by adding together the dividend yield and the capital gains yield. And so we can get our total percentage return simply by adding these two yields together. Are there any questions? Okay, so let's work our example and talk about percentage returns. Our dividend yield, we don't have to multiply by 100 shares on both of these because after all, it would just cancel out. And so we've just got $1.85 divided by 37 gives us 0.05, which is 5%. We would say that this stock has a dividend yield of 5%. Capital gains yield, we're going to take that, uh, that growth in the stock price and divide by the original price and come up with 0.09, which is 9%. Dividend yield will always be zero or positive dividend yield will always be zero or positive. The capital gains yield could actually be negative. Can you tell me why? Mr. Boonchat. Investment is not value. Yeah, if the stock price went down, for instance, at the height of the mania, you bought AMC. Hmm. And now, in case you don't know, it's gone down quite a bit. And uh, I doubt they're paying dividends, but even if they were paying a small dividend, you could still have a negative uh, capital gain and you could have a negative total return if that negative capital gain swamped your dividend yield. So most common mistake students make in that case is that they take the beginning price minus the ending price and they'll wind up with a positive capital gain even though the stock has lost value. So always check to make sure you've got it in the correct order. Our total percentage return, we're just going to add those two things together. 5%, 9% give us 14%. Now we're back at the cocktail party. 
we're talking, you say, Dr. Haggard, how is your portfolio doing? I say, well, I've got percentage returns of 14%. Do you know whether to be impressed or not? Once again, there's an issue because the whole point of investing is to provide an ability to increase your consumption, right? And uh, you're wondering, well, could I buy you a drink or could I buy you a Lamborghini with my 14%? Does that make sense? And if you say, well, how much did you invest? And I say, $1,000. I'm not even sure I could cover a drink in some places. Right? But if I said $100 million, now suddenly you're impressed. So neither one of these things actually tell us everything we need to know. Neither one of them will tell us everything we need to know. Now we can go back and check our work by dividing that total dollar return of 518 by the initial investment of 3,700. How did I get 3,700? What two numbers did I multiply together? 37 and 100. Yeah, 37 and 100 is $37 per share times 100 shares is $3,700. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. We get exactly the same number, so this is a way to check your work. Now, let's talk about what's happened over history. History sounds boring. Uh, first thing I want to point, point out to you, though, is that this is not a normal graph. On a normal graph, over here on the left, we would go from 0 to 1 to 2 to 3 to 4 to 5 to 6. Instead, we've got 0 to 1, taking up the same amount of space as 1 to 10, taking up the same amount of space as 10 to 100. This is what's called a logarithmic scale. A logarithmic scale. The reason we use a logarithmic scale when we're talking about stock returns is so that a 5% increase down toward the bottom is the same amount of altitude that a 5% increase up top is. If we went in, in terms of um, just a straight scale, it would, it would look really funky. And so this is the way we do it. Okay, now I want you to notice that this thing is, starts at 1925. It's actually December 31st, 1925, because our first good stock market data, or securities data in total, starts on January 1st, 1926. And you say, is that when we started trading stocks? No, we've been trading stocks for hundreds of years under the buttonwood tree on Wall Street. But do you think when Ben Franklin bought stock, it got put into a database for future generations to look at the trade. No. And so that's why the date is only really good starting January 1st, 1926. And what we're going to do here is look at what happens when you put a dollar into any given asset. Uh, what is that investment going to be worth in, I think this could, yeah, it goes all the way through 2013. And so, and you know, I know we've had some more time since then, but this whole pattern does not change. We're going to see that. In fact, you can see it over the period we're looking at here. Okay, now, several important things happened over this time period. What happened um, starting in the late 20s and through the mid-30s? Yeah, the Great Depression. We have the stock market crash in 1929. Then we have the Great Depression. Now. Uh, what happens between 1939 and 1945? Yeah, World War II. So then there's some, some crumminess there. And then things start to take off. Now, have we had troubles since then? Yeah. Have we had financial ups and downs? Sure. I personally have lived through the following crashes. 1987, the dot-com bust the real estate best, also known as a financial, what's it called, financial crisis, thank you. And I don't know why we would just call that, but they're all financial crises, right? Mm -hmm. And then we've got this COVID crap. So I've lived through four of these. And the fun thing is, the more of them you live through, the calmer you are. I remember 1987, I was 16 years old. And I said to my dad, I said, are you gonna sell your stock? He says, heck no, he says, I'm buying. And, and the phone would ring off the hook. My dad was like the, the stock guru of the neighborhood, even though it's high school education, right? But he does love reading. 
And he would say, don't sell your stock. And they'd say, okay. And, yeah. and then he'd run into him a couple, three weeks later. So what happened? Oh, I sold my stock. <laughs> like, no, don't do that. Okay, so that's, uh, that's how bad the math part of his fortune. Okay, back to the story. So we've got all sorts of stuff going on here, but we're going to see that there's an amazing amount of stability in or the, the patterns remain stable. Now, there's one thing up here that you can't invest in, and that is inflation. But we put it in there because anything that is above that line represents a real return on your investment. It represents an increase in your ability to consume. And over the time period we're looking at here, most of the time, everything has a positive real return. We can see that there are a couple of times when inflation is greater than the treasury bill return. But overall, over this whole period, we can see that's not the case. Okay, now, uh, let's talk about inflation. Um, 13 times as much. And I remember talking to my grandfather about what things cost back in 1925. Old people love to talk about how cheap stuff was when they were kids. I'll give you an example. I remember my dad buying gas for 45 cents a gallon. I have personally paid 65 cents a gallon for gas. Yeah, there was a war in the Middle East and people wanted to turn on the tap so they could fund their war and whoa, gas prices went down. We all had a good time. Back, well, except for the people in the war. They were having a bad time. Okay, now, so, uh, infl uh, let's see where we're at, inflation, okay, so, uh, when I talk to him about what things cost, this sounds roughly right, you know, it's, it's like a candy bar costs 13 times as much as it did then, it makes kind of sense. Okay, on with the story. Um, the first real thing we see here you can invest in are treasury bills. Treasury bills are the short-term debt of the United States federal government. Treasury bills are the short-term debt of the United States federal government. Now, in accounting and finance, when we say short-term, what do we mean? Yeah, less than a year. And the one on this chart is the three-month United States Treasury bill, which is kind of the benchmark that we always use. And it is the lowest maturity bill that is frequently and liquidly traded. There are perhaps one month treasury bills, but they don't trade nearly as often. So the three month is the benchmark. Now, here's what you need to know about the risk of lending money to people. There are two risks. Have you ever loaned money to a friend? Yeah, if you haven't, you're probably either not human or you're a very bad person, right? Because at one point or another, someone's like, hey man, I really need, so you give them some money, and then what happens? What happens sometimes? They don't pay, so that's default risk. That's default <coughs> risk. The risk that the borrower doesn't pay. Default risk. The risk that the borrower doesn't pay. The other kind of risk is called price risk or interest rate risk, price risk or interest rate risk. And that is the risk that the value of the asset will go down because interest rates have gone up. Keep in mind that the price or value of anything is the present value of the future cash flows discounted at a rate appropriate to the risk. If you actually bothered to watch my chapter four stuff, you know that. Now, what if interest rates go up? What happens to present value? If I divide by a bigger number, what do I get? I get a smaller number. And so when interest rates go up, bond prices, bond values go down. And so those are the two things going on here. Now, this three-month treasury bill that we're looking at, we tend to call it our stand-in or proxy for the risk-free asset. Why is it risk-free? Well, it's not truly risk-free from an interest rate perspective because T here is 0.25 of a year, but for 
any change in R, that thing gets basically unmagnified to the 0.25 power. And so it changes in interest rates that don't make the price change all that much. If we were truly looking for no interest rate risk whatsoever, it would be due in the next second. But people hardly ever make loans like that, right? Okay, so um, as interest rates go up, prices come down. That's the risk. Of course, it could go the other way, right? What if interest rates go down, the values of your bonds go up? And we benefited from that, say, five, ten years ago. Okay. Now, what about default risk? We said default risk is the risk that someone does not pay. Why would the United States Treasury debt be thought to be default risk free? Yeah, so that's the big one. The United States government can print money. And they're doing that right now. And they're doing it in a rather sneaky kind of way for people who are uneducated on how this works. So here's what happens. The Federal Reserve has what they call, they've got an, we have an elastic money supply. And that allows the Federal Reserve to grow the money supply as the economy grows or to shrink it as the economy shrinks. And as long as they do it at the same rate that we're growing or shrinking, we do not experience inflation because we've got the same amount of money chasing the same amount of goods. In fact, the Fed targets around 2% inflation per year. And for years they were upset that they were unable to get it up to 2%. What was the last reported inflation figure? Seven and a half something, right? Oh my, I bet they'd be happy to have 2% at this point. So what does this mean? They have created too much money. How does the Fed create money? It turns out what they do is they go out and buy debt on in what they call open market operations. And where do they get the money? They pull it out of thin air. They pull it out of thin air and they go out and they buy these debt instruments. And what kind of debt instruments are they buying? The ones of the United States government, right? So they're going out and buying this government debt and that's how we're getting flooded with cash in the economy is because of these open market operations. Okay, now that's the first way that we think of the debt being default risk free. The other way is that it's backed by the full faith and credit of the United States government and their ability to tax. How popular is it to raise taxes? Not very. If in a democracy, if you want to get reelected, how likely are you to want to raise taxes? It's an uphill battle, right? I remember 1984, Walter Mondale stood up and said, I'm gonna raise taxes if elected president. And I'm like, phew, he's a dead duck. Sure enough, Reagan whipped him in every state except for Minnesota, which is like where the guy was from. Okay, back to the story. Do you think the United States government has always paid its debts? No, do you know when? Okay, which war? Sure. How about the very first one? The one that created the United States? By the way, in case you don't know, the United States used to be a colony of Great Britain, right? And uh, we fought a war against them. We didn't win it on our own. We had help from, does anybody know? The French! Now, do the French love Americans? No. no. The French only love the French, so far as I can tell. So, why were they helping us against the English? Eh, ish. How about this? The enemy of my enemy is my friend. If I can supply these Yankees with the goods to fight a war, maybe they'll kill some British people so I don't have to and my guys won't get injured doing that dirty work. Does that make sense? Okay, so most of the help that we got from the French, we got a little military assistance, but we got a lot of credit. And with that credit, we bought gunpowder and lead and the kinds of things you need to get rid of British people from your country. Now it's the end of the war. We've won. It's the end of war party. The French show up. 
and they say, wah, wah, wah. Congratulations, you are a nation. By the way, that is my French accent. Okay, so. Oh, is that what it sounded like? Oh, wow, I'll have to watch that and see. You can tell that my cultural, pop cultural reference is very, very shallow. Back to the story. Um, so the French, are, and then we say, thank you, thank you. And they say, ha, 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 pay us what you will. Now, here's the problem. The United States, at that time, was a largely agrarian nation. What does agrarian mean? We're just a bunch of dirt farmers, right? We're a bunch of dirt farmers. We don't ha even have our own currency. At the time, we're using the Spanish dollar, right? Uh, we're certainly not going to use British pounds. And so, uh, we haven't really put together some sort of taxing ability yet. In fact, George Washington led a war to, to get people who make whiskey to pay taxes on it. That's how rough things were at the point that all this is happening. And so basically we say, look, there's no way we can pay. And that is, so far as I know, the first and last time the United States government defaulted on its debt. And so if anyone ever tells you the United States government doesn't default on its debt, you can say, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> yes, they do, or they have, right? Back to the story. Wow, that was a long story. But where does it get us? This treasury bill is free of default risk, in theory. And it also has very, 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 very little price or interest rate risk. And if you invested a dollar back in December 31st, 1925, you would have $20.57 in 2013. You say, wow, I'd have more than 20 times as much. That sounds pretty good. Until you look at the next item up. Long-term government bonds. If you invested $1 in that, you would have $123.12 at the end. That's like six times as much. Now, let's ask this question. Who is the borrower for long-term government bonds? It's the same as the borrower for the short-term treasuries, right? And so it's the United States government. And so how much default risk, in theory, does this debt have? None, in theory, right? Now, the big question is, why does it return so much more? And the answer is that risk and return must go together. Risk and return must go together. If there's no default risk here, then we must know that the price or interest rate risk is greater for these long-term bonds. And it is. And the reason why it is, is because instead of being 0.25 for this T. Now that last T is 30. And so whatever little change in interest rate gets magnified to the 30th power. Can you see how you could end up with a whole lot of interest rate risk when you go out that far? And so every time that the uh, interest rate changes a little bit, there's going to fluctuate more in value than the treasury bills. And I want you to notice something about that treasury bill line. It's smooth. It's smooth as a baby's bottom. That is an indication of little or no risk. Then look at the long-term government bonds line. Is it as smooth? No, it's, it's more rough. That's an indication of greater risk. The more this thing jumps around, the greater risk the risk. Okay, now, something that they've left off the chart, but would be the very next thing for us to talk about before large company stocks would be um, corporate bonds. Corporate bonds. Now, let's talk about why corporate bonds would require a higher return than long-term government bonds. If you've got a long-term government bond 30 years and a corporate bond 30 years, they've got the same amount of price or interest rate risk. What would the difference be? The yeah, the default risk, because companies can and do go bankrupt. 
And you can think of uh, uh, companies, and I'll, I'll tell you a quick story here. This is a true story. You know, I always have to preface these things. I was invited by a local trust company to talk to their 12 most important clients. By the way, who do you think their 12 most important clients are? The poorest ones? No, it's, <laughs> this is the, the richest ones, and this is a bunch of old dudes. And uh, they're sitting around the table, and they're all complaining. This was shortly after the General Motors bankruptcy. They, having, by the way, this is like the World War II crowd, the World War II Korean War. They had grown up in an America where people said, what's good for General Motors is good for America. And these things were almost intertwined in their minds, and it was just beyond any sort of thinking that General Motors would ever go bankrupt. And so these old dudes had bought bonds from GM. And then GM went bankrupt. And so there is default risk in these corporate bonds. But corporate bonds aren't as risky as corporate stock. Can anyone tell me why? You remember we talked about stockholders being a residual claimant. What does that mean for where they are in the line to get paid? They're at the very end, right? The common shareholders are at the very end of the line. And so a bondholder is going to get paid before the common shareholder. The bondholder will get paid before the common shareholder. And so the bonds of a firm will always be safer than the stock of a firm. The bonds of a firm will always be safer than the stock of a firm. And so that's why I could say if we had long-term large company bonds up here, that the return would be somewhere between long-term government bonds and large company stocks. I don't know why they didn't put those on here. Okay, now when we move on up, we have stocks and we said that they're both risky because of the order that you stand in for payment. But we see that large company stocks don't return nearly as much as small company stocks. Do you remember what we said earlier about risk and reward have to go together? What does that mean about small companies versus large companies? Are they riskier or safer? Riskier. Yeah, they're riskier. And so, oh, and I, I had a student, uh, well, I was giving this talk, and he says, well, you know, the small companies, a lot of those die, but this is only looking at the ones that survive. No, this data is survivorship bias free. In other words, not only do they look at the ones that survive and thrive, they look at the dead ones too. And then he had a brilliant idea. He said, Wow, what if you only bought the ones that are going to live and don't buy the ones that are going to die? I said, that's brilliant. Can you tell me which ones of the small stocks today are going to live and which ones are going to die? And he says, uh, I said, if you figured this out, come to my office. We'll get rich together, right? So far, I've yet to find anyone who can tell you for sure, because no one can predict the future with certainty. So who would have thought, uh, and, and of course, I'm older than you guys, but growing up, the thought that General Motors could ever go bankrupt, that was remote. And just even back 20 years ago, or yeah, 20, the thought that General Electric would be in such bad shape. You know, you, you just can't predict the future. The, the things that we have now, like I take for granted my Apple Watch, my iPhone, uh, streaming. Thank God I don't have to watch what the networks are forking out over the airwaves anymore, right? Um, all that changes. Could you have predicted all of that with perfection? Absolutely not. And so that's why it's impossible. It's impossible for us to know which one of these firms is going to die and which one of them is going to live. In fact, um, I'll, I'll give you an example here. Down in Louisiana, where I used to live, uh, we had alligators. And uh, when you when you go alligator hunting, which I've been alligator hunting, 
If you go alligator hunting and you see a really big one, the Cajuns will say, Cajuns are the people that live there. The Cajuns will say, oh, he must be really smart. By the way, the Cajuns' natural language is French, so that kind of sounds like the French dude, right? Is, Whoa, he, he must be smart. Now, what the hell does being 12 foot long have to do with your IQ? Yeah, survival. And so, if if a company lives long enough, or I mean, if a gator lives long enough to be 12 foot long, they must be doing something right. If a company lives long enough to be a large company stock, they must be doing something right. Now, back to our example of the pool of the alligators. If you look in a pool with 30 baby alligators, probably only one of them is going to make it to 12 foot long. If you want to own a piece of that gator, what do you have to do? You, yeah, you buy one small, but out of the 30 in the in the kiddie pool, which is, by the way, where they put them when they're freaky, right? Okay, out of the 30 gators in the kiddie pool, how do you figure out which one's going to live? You don't. So what do you do? You buy all 30 gators. And that's what we're doing here with these small company stocks. We're buying all of them. And that's the return when you buy all of them, both the future winners and the future losers. Okay, so we discussed that a company must be doing something right if they become a large company because most, unless you're started by the government, you start as a small company and the only way to become a large company is by being successful. Does that make sense? So think about all the electric car startups and how many of them have died or remained small companies. And then compare that with Tesla. He, Tesla must be doing something right, something different or they would not have become the large company they are. What does that mean for risk? Well, we know they've got a, an established management team and a strategy that seems to be working. That's point number one in making them safer than the other electric car companies. Number two, we know that they're big enough to be able to reach out to the capital markets to get money in times of need. That's something that small companies don't always have. And uh, let's see, number three, Tesla is more diversified. So Tesla, not only do they do cars, what else do they do? Tequila. Say again? Tequila. Tequila, oh my goodness. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about the weird stuff. Tequila, flamethrower, bricks. So, okay, so now you're getting into the less weird. So they do solar panels, they do solar city or whatever it was. And then they also do the Tesla power wall, and if they ever get it perfected, the solar roof, I mean, they get into a lot of different things. And what we're gonna find out in chapter 11 is if you have a diversified portfolio, the returns on that portfolio are far less risky. And so um, Tesla is benefiting from some of that diversification of risk. And so those are your reasons that the, the, the big companies are safer. Number one, proven management team strategy, Number two, probably have better access to the capital markets or even just more cash sitting in the pile. And number three, they're probably not just doing one thing, right? So let's think about there's a small Chinese startup making windmills versus um, General Electric is also makes windmills. By the way, I know the guy that's in charge of the GE onshore windmill. Cool guy, really smart will not link with me on LinkedIn for anything. I don't blame it. Back to the story. Um, so if you look at both of these, and, and the main thing that's driving this wind energy right now are government subsidies. And so if you suddenly took away government subsidies, is it going to hurt General Electric? Yeah. What percentage of their revenue comes from that? Tiny. It's like rounding error on their income statement. What about the small Chinese startup? What are they into? Only windmills. And so if that market gets destroyed, it destroys the company. And so there's your example of how diversification can help save a company, a large company versus a small one. Yes? Okay, but since Tesla is like established and like we know that they're less risky, isn't the return much less getting in now that we know that? Oh yes, she is smart. Okay. So if you say, wow, Tesla's returned 
so much over the last five years and you say I'm gonna get in and it's gonna return that much over the next five years no right so we know risk and return have to go together people that put money into Tesla five years ago were risking it and in fact I called them idiots and they may still be who knows you know it may still just go to crap who knows right because we can't predict the future what if we find out that lithium batteries cause cancer or they're bad for the ducks or something, right? They are bad for the ducks. Back to the story. Okay, so she's absolutely right. And there's another thing. Tesla's ability to grow. Back in the day, their ability to grow seemed almost limitless. Well, yeah, percentage-wise. But what about today? I mean, after every man, woman, and child on the planet gets an electric car, and assuming Tesla was the only maker of those electric cars, we would still hit a point where their sales could not grow as fast as they currently do. The second thing to know is, is Tesla the only electric car maker anymore? No, GM's getting into it, Ford's getting into it, Volkswagen's certainly getting into it. So, Tesla's growth opportunities are much less than they used to be. So, the risk is lower, the growth opportunities are less you're not going to see the kind of returns on Tesla that you saw in the past. Does that make sense? Okay. Any questions on this before we move forward? Now, people say, do I need to memorize the order? Like, no. Memorize the logic. Because you can reproduce this order in your head if you will just think about the things that we talked about. Okay, now we're on to returns by year, and we're going to look at large company stocks and small company stocks. And this is a histogram. And a histogram is basically where you put something in a bucket or a range of percentages, in this case. And we've got buckets that are basically 10% apiece. And so anything between 0 and 10% gets stacked at between the number 0 and the number 10. Anything between 10 and 20 gets stacked between 10 and 20. And so you can see the years have been put in there. The first thing I want you to notice about this is it has a roughly familiar shape. What would we call that shape? Yeah, the bell curve, the normal distribution. And we're going to show, we're going to talk about that we assume stock prices are normally distributed, but there are a couple of reasons that we know that they're not. But it's still a fairly good approximation compared to other things we could assume. Okay, now as we go in there, we can look at different years. And let's say it's, it's 1926. What are the returns in 1926? Just look at the bottom row. Between 10 and 20, right? Between 10 and 20. Okay, your friend says, hey man, I made 15% in the stock market. And you say, hmm, sounds risky. I think I'll wait another year. At the end of the next year, 1927, you run into your friend, What's his return now? 30 and 40. Yeah, between 30 and 40. And your friend says, hey, man, I'm getting filthy rich. And you say, mm, I'm not sure. So you wait another year. And at the end of 1928, you run into your friend, and he says, his returns were between 40 and 50. You say, damn. I got to get some of this. <laughs> so you take all your money and you put it in the stock market. What happens in 1929? What's the return? Between zero and negative 10, you've lost money. Now, if you had only looked between uh, October and the end of the year, it would have been even worse, right? And so the reason that this return is as high as it is, is because that crash happened late in the year. So, you say, well, certainly that was a once-in-a-lifetime event. And so you hang on. Next year, what happens? Yeah, minus 20 to minus 30%. You say, 
Uh, certainly it can't continue anymore. What happens in 1931? Between negative 40 and negative 50 percent. You're just starting to lose your mind, right? So you say, well, I'll hang in for one more year. You hang in for one more year in 1932. By the way, I'll help you out. It's stacked above 1929. You're like, you know what? Forget it. I'm out. You sell what's left of your stock. You get enough money to buy a pack of cigarettes and a candy bar. And then in 1933, what happens? Between 50 and 60%. Now, why do I walk through all of this with you? Because my point to you is you can't judge what the market's going to do based on what it's recently done. You can't. There is a phenomenon called momentum, which is where you buy losers from the last six months, or you, you buy winners from the last six months, you sell losers from the last six months, and you hold them for six months, and you can end up getting a positive abnormal return out of that. But after that was identified, people start investing on that and now that momentum is almost gone away and so when you find any of these tricky little things that make it look like you can make money extra as soon as everyone else knows about it they go away right okay so my point to you is this don't try to time the stock market don't 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 i have a colleague he's retired now none of you probably ever had him and I ran into him. He also happens to be my neighbor. I ran into him out on the sidewalk. We were both picking up dog poop because that's what you do in the burbs. And I said, hey, how you doing? He says, oh, rotten. I said, why? He says, well, you remember that first COVID drop in the stock market? I said, yeah. He says, I sold everything. He says, I'm sitting on cash. He says, but I'm pretty sure I'll have another opportunity. Has he had another opportunity? To, to get back in below that level? No. Can you time the market? Absolutely not. Should you try? No. What should you do instead? I invest the same amount every month. And if, if things are, are high, then that means I'm getting fewer shares of stock. And if things are low, that means I'm getting more shares of stock. So right now, the market is somewhat down as we talk. I'm actually happy, right? Because mm -hmm. I'm not selling that stuff, I'm buying. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's talk about risk in your portfolio. My primary rationale for investing isn't so I can have a fancy car or anything like that. It's to have money to eat when I'm old. And that's what I would encourage you to think of is, is investing is for your old age. Now. Let's talk about the kind of risk you can stand. Let's go back one slide. If you were going to buy any of these assets for a retiree, what would you buy? Would you go with small stocks? No. So here's the problem with small stocks and retirees. Small stocks don't pay dividends, and so what you'd have to do is sell a small portion of your portfolio every month or so to try to maintain your lifestyle. And so when small stocks are way up and you sell, let's say, $2,000 worth, not a big deal. But what about when small stocks are down? And you're like, wow, $2,000 is a really bigger, a relatively bigger portion of my portfolio now. If I sell it now, when it goes back up, I won't have as much principal in there to earn those outsized returns. And so if you are depending on something for your consumption, you don't want something that is risky. However, if you are most of your age, it's, I think we've figured out that all of you are younger than me, um, can you afford to be in small stocks right now for your retirement? Absolutely you can't, because these little ups and downs don't matter much to you at all. And so if I were you, I would be in small company stocks. As you get closer to retirement, you might want to ratchet that down, large company stocks. And then as you get even closer, you might want to get into bonds because they have a guaranteed payout pattern, which is good for retirees. 
And, uh, you know, it, I don't know that I would ever tell anyone to be in pure T-bills because the return's just not there. It is a good place to park cash that you aren't using otherwise right now, though. Let's say you're getting ready because you're old. You're getting ready to buy a Cadillac because old people love Cadillacs, right? Getting ready to buy a Cadillac. Um, do you want to plow your money into stocks? You're going to buy one when the new ones come out in October. Do you want, no, you don't want to put it in stocks because you don't know what stocks are going to be doing by then. So you want to park that cash somewhere. You can make a little interest on it, and T-bills would do that for you. And that money would be there when you finally get around to buying your Cadillac. Does that make sense? Okay. Now I want you to look at small stocks, and I want you to notice a couple of things. First of all, that nice clean bell shape that we had, gone. I mean, it's somewhat there, but it looks a whole lot less regular. And the second thing I want to point out is the, the minimums and maximums. The biggest loss that we have on large company stocks is minus 50. The biggest gain we have is plus 60. What's the biggest loss we have on small company stocks? Minus, is, yeah, minus 15 and minus 60. What's the biggest gain? Oh my goodness, 140 to 150. By the way, this is one of the things that we say that about stocks not being normally distributed. You can go to 140 plus 140, 150. It's happened, right? But can you go to minus 140 or 150? What's the lowest a stock price can ever be thanks to limited liability? Zero. If something goes from a dollar to zero overnight, what's that return? Yeah, it's negative 100%. That's the lowest the return can ever be. Usually when I ask what's the lowest return a stock can, or a stock can ever have, people will say zero. And I'm like, phew, I wish, right? It means you'd never lose money on stocks, but it's just not true. Okay, now, why do, um, why are small stocks spread out more like this? Because they are riskier. They are riskier. That's why they have a bigger spread. And so we can look at these pictures a lot, but eventually we're gonna to have to come up with a mathematical way to measure this risk, this dispersion of returns. So first let's call, talk about something called the risk premium. We know that risk and reward have to go together. The riskier a security is, the greater the return must be. Now, does that mean if you don't take any risk, you don't get any return? No, you can get something called the risk-free rate. The risk-free rate is what you earn on the risk-free asset, which is a hypothetical beast, much like the Loch Ness Monster. No one's ever truly spotted it in the wild. But we have something that we think is very, very close to it, and that is, remember our three-month treasury bill? That's what we use as our stand-in for the risk-free asset, and therefore the return on that would be the risk-free rate. So that's our stand-in for the risk-free rate is the yield on the three-month treasury bill. Now, if you are getting anything over that risk-free rate, you must be taking some sort of risk because the market does not reward you for not taking risk. So anything above the risk-free rate must be a reward for taking risk. We call it the risk premium. And the risk premium is simply the return on something minus the risk-free rate. Now, it could be the return on a single stock, and we would just call it that, the risk premium on stock. Or it could be the risk premium on the market, which is where we take, say, the return on the S&P 500 and subtract that risk-free rate, the three-month treasury bill, and that extra would be known as the market risk premium, the market risk premium. Now, let me tell you how to know someone is trying to scam you. If they come to you and they say, hey, I've got this great investment, it pays 10% and it has no risk whatsoever. By the way, the risk-free rate right now, is, I think it's less than 2%. If they're telling you that you're, taking, you're gonna get 10% and there's no risk, you know they are lying to you. 
because a 10% return would only be offered for something that gave risk over and above the risk-free rate. Does that make sense? And so if you ever watch the show American Greed on CNBC, there's always, and it's, oh, I feel so bad for them, old people. They, they hunt down old people because old people are usually, especially if they're early in retirement, they're sitting on large amounts of cash, right? Or investments. And so they go to these old people, and by the way, old people are also risk averse. And they tell them, oh, hey, we've got this investment, and um, it's going to pay 10%, and it's totally risk-free. I wish, I, I may have to go on a speaking tour of old folks' homes to let these people know, stop, right? Because you, you know this is a scam. And then the old people say, well, wait a minute, is my deposit insured by the FDIC? What do you think the, by the way, do you guys know what the FDIC is? Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. What do you think the scammers say? Is it insured by the FDIC? It's not, but they'll say, we have private insurance, and they'll show them some multiple Xerox copy of something with the Lloyds of London emblem on it. I'm not kidding, I've seen this over and over again on American Greed. And the old people are like, oh, we know about Lloyds of London, they're really famous, it must be okay. Do you think the, the insurance from Lloyds of London is real? No. Do you think the old people ever bother to call Lloyds of London to ask? No. And so that's how people get scammed. So just know that anytime someone's offering you a higher rate of return than a risk-free rate, there will be risk involved. So what we're going to look at now is the distribution of returns for each of these categories that we looked at previously. And there's an additional category here that not, wasn't on the chart, and that is long-term corporate bonds. And uh, of course, don't look at inflation. You don't need to worry about it. But let's start from the bottom with US Treasury bills. And you can look at the histogram over on the side, the histogram of returns. Would you characterize that as being tall and skinny or short and spread out? Tall and skinny. It turns out that if you have a relatively risk-free um, investment, that the distribution is going to be very, very thin. It's going to be all compacted into a very small region. The next one up, intermediate term government bonds. Those weren't on our picture either, but you can guess they've got more price risk than the short term government bonds or, or bills. And so you notice they're a little more spread out. That spread is indicative of the risk. Now, by the time you get up to small company stocks, this thing is spread way out to the point that the distribution looks like you cut a fried egg right down the middle and looked at it. You guys know about fried eggs? This should be yellow, right? Or green if your chickens have been eating grass, but I digress. My point to you is that when you see a distribution, a normal distribution that looks like a fried egg, that is hugely risky. Now I want you to notice something though about the, 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 the average return on these. The riskier you go, which is going up, we see higher and higher returns, which makes perfect sense because we said risk and return have to go together. And then we, we said we we're going to have to come up with a measurement for this dispersion of returns because that's our measure of risk. And that measure is standard deviation. I'm going to teach you how to calculate it, but we've just given it to you here. And we're moving up from treasury bills, which have a standard deviation of 3.1%, which tells us they're not truly risk-free, right? Because if they were truly risk-free, the standard deviation would be zero. Then we move up to intermediate term and we're up to 5.6%. Long-term government bonds, 9.7%, and then something weird happens. Take a look at long-term corporate bonds. A return of 6.4 is higher than a return of 6.1, therefore long-term corporate bonds must be riskier. But they may, that means they should have a higher standard deviation, but they don't. They don't. This is what we call an anomaly. An anomaly. 
Let's say that everyone in your family ever born throughout history has had black hair. Everyone. And then suddenly you're born and you've got red hair. You would be an anomaly, right? Because it's not what's expected. It doesn't fit with our models. Okay. Any questions about that? Check out, oh, by the way, let's figure some risk premiums. Do you remember the definition of risk premium? It's the expected return on the item minus the risk-free rate. And so what would the risk-free rate be? If just looking at this chart, what's the risk-free rate? What do we say was our stand-in for the risk-free asset? Ms. Hep, what's the stand-in for the risk-free asset? Very good, the U.S. Treasury bill. What's the return on the Treasury bill? 3.6%. Therefore, our best guess for the risk-free rate is 3.6%. Okay, now don't memorize that number because I'll, I'll probably give you a different one during the exam. But it's always what's on the Treasury bill is what we consider the risk-free rate. Okay, now what would be then the risk premium on intermediate term government bonds. And feel free to use your calculator. How about I calculate that? 5.5 minus 3.6. So it comes out to be, I think, 1.9. Right? Uh, what if we look at long term government bonds? 6.1 minus 3.6, so we're looking at a 2.5% risk premium. The risk premium grows in direct proportion to the additional risk. Okay, now, uh, just for fun, let's look up here at small company stocks. What would you do for risk premium? Ms. Herdman, what would it do? Very good, 16.5 minus 3.6. And that would give us 12.9, I believe. So we're looking at going from 2.5 on these long-term government bonds all the way up to, what did we just say, 12.9? So what does that tell us about small stocks? Basically that they are, what, four times, five times riskier? Yeah. Okay. Any questions about this slide? Okay. So we just mentioned our first glance of a risk statistic. So we need a mathematical measure of this risk. We've seen the, the pictures of the line. And we know that the rougher it is, the riskier it is. We know if you look at a distribution, the flatter and wider it is, the greater the uh, risk. But we need some way to measure that. And the answer comes from your QBA class or your statistics class. The measures of dispersion that you talked about were standard deviation and variance. Do you guys remember those terms at all? Yeah. Okay. So what's the relationship between standard deviation and variance? You got it backwards. Okay. So if you take standard deviation and you square it, you get variance. So which one of these are we going to choose? Oh, by the way, the greater these are, the bigger they are, the riskier they are. So if you've got a stock with a greater variance versus another one, the, the first stock is riskier. Now, why do we choose one of the other? So we're going to choose standard deviation. And the reason we do that is because it is in the same units as return. Standard deviation is in the same units as return. It is in percent. And so you have 5% return and 7.5% standard deviation. These are all things we can wrap our head around. And by the way, the normal distribution I can define as long as I have the average and the standard deviation. I can define the entire normal distribution with those two things. Here's the problem with variance. 
variance is determined or is, is defined in terms of percent squared. Can you guys interpret percent squared? No. So I've got a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering. I've got an MBA from the fabulous Kent State University. And I've got a PhD in finance. I can't interpret percent squared. It's just not something we can really wrap our heads around. And so that's, those are the two big reasons. Number one, it's the same units as return. No, it's three, three reasons. One thing is, is return. Number two, it's how we define the normal distribution. And number three, we just can't wrap our heads around percent squared. Does that make sense? Okay. So, next time, I want you to bring your calculator. If you didn't bring it today, definitely bring it next time. And by the way, when you come to my office to look at your exam, if you, if you do decide to do that, bring your calculator with you. Also, bring your ID because I'll need to see your ID. Some of you have got your names down so far, but some of you not, so bring your ID when you come. ID, calculator, pencil eraser, you can actually write on the thing that I give you. However, you cannot take it with you out of my office, so you'll have to turn it back in before you go. Any questions? Okay, have a good day. If we get back to where we were, I think this is where we were last time. Does that sound about right? So let's talk about what we've got here. We've got a sample of returns for a single stock. A sample of returns for single stock. And it's over a four year period. Now, it's entirely possible the stock's been around a lot longer than that, but we only have four years worth of data. And we have in percentages, and then we have it in decimals. Do you know how to convert from percentage to decimal? Ms. Herdman, what do you do? Okay, so she says move to decimal places, two places, and she's right. But I would also have accepted uh, divide by 100 to get, so from percentage to decimal, right? Divide by 100, does that make sense? Okay. Now. Why would we put it in decimals? Well, it turns out when we get around to calculating the variance, it's going to make a whole lot more sense to us. And be, yeah, so uh, as I said last time, squared percent or percent squared is kind of a freaky unit for us. So, what is up with you today? It's just like my dog, sometimes they just don't behave. Okay, so what are we going to do? Well, in the sample standard deviation, the first step is to figure out what is the expected return, which is, in this case, just the average. Now, we, we use the term arithmetic mean down here, but it's if you ask your grandma or your mom to do average, this is what they would tell you to do. What are they going to tell you to do? What's the procedure? First step. Catch your what? Okay, so add them all together. Yeah, first step is add them all together. So we're going to add all those decimals together. And then, what are we going to do? Divide by four. Divide by four. And so that's the first step. And we can, let's uh, go ahead and get your calculator out. Let's do that. Next step is to divide by the number of items we have, which is 4. Divide by 4 gives us 0.2144. So here's what I'm going to do with that number. I'm going to go ahead and store it. And, and I'm going to store it in location 0, so it's out of the way. The reason that I'm doing that is because in order to figure standard deviation, 
you have to subtract that number from every one of your returns. So we're going to be using that four times. If you had six years worth of data, you would be using it six times. And so it's important to go ahead and put that somewhere where we can get to it easily. Are there any questions about arithmetic mean, how we got there? Okay. Now we're going to calculate the sample standard deviation. And the way we do that is we take the return for each period and subtract that mean. And so when we take 0.137, in fact, let's go ahead and do it. 0.137 minus, recall, 0 equals. It gives us that number right there. Now, students tend to want to work this thing by columns. And so the natural instinct, in fact, of humans is to work down that column. I'm going to show you that it's a whole lot better if you work it the way that I'm going to show you. And that is to work across. And the reason that is, is because the very next column over says deviation squared. I think we just, we just calculated was the deviation. And so if we're going to square that thing, why would I want to store that number or write it down? By the way, don't write crap down. Don't, don't, don't. Save it in your calculator. Uh, never write it down until the very end. Any ideas why? Three good reasons. Number one. Someone throw one. Waste of time. Wait, okay. Four good reasons. <laughs> it's a waste of time. What's another one? Yeah, rounding. Some of you folks don't know how to round, and even those that do, you're losing some accuracy from these numbers. What's another reason? I'll give you a hint. Are you perfect? Now, even if you manage to write the entire number down, you might make a mistake. And then, when you go back to punch it back into your calculator, guess what? There's another opportunity for a mistake. Knowing I am as flawed as I am, I try to eliminate opportunities for such stuff to happen. So that's why I'm going to work across here instead of down. So that means the next step that I'm going to do is to square that standard deviation. What button do you think I should have on the calculator next? This isn't a trick question. Ms. Herdman. Uh, X to the second. Yeah, X to the second. Very good. And I get this number right here. Now, two things I want you to notice. Number one, what happened to the minus sign? It disappeared. It disappeared. And the reason it disappeared is because, anybody? A negative and a negative become positive. Oh, very good. A negative times a negative is a positive. Okay, that's the first thing I want you to notice. And by the way, that's actually why we do squaring in these problems. If we, so we're looking for a measurement of what is the, basically the average amount this thing is off. And what we want to do is, uh, if we right now, if we had just added those deviations together, they would equal zero, and that wouldn't tell us anything. And so we're just interested really in the distance that we are away, not which direction, and so we're going to square all of these things. Now the second thing I want you to notice is when you square a number with four decimal places, you get eight. If you square something with three decimal places, what do you think you get? Six. If you square something with two decimal places, you get four. Okay. So, now I've got that number, and I've got to go to work on the next one. But before I do, I'm going to store this thing, and I'm going to store it in location number one. See how I did that? Stow one. Okay, now I'm going to hit clear. Next one is point three five eight. Minus, where do I have that mean hanging out, the average? Zero. Yeah, recall zero equals. And there's the same deviation. What's the next step? Square, Square it. <laughs> and then what should I do? Store that. Store it. And where, where are we going to store it? Two. Two. Very good. Clear. Point <coughs> four, five, one, four. Minus. Recall zero equals 0.237. By the way, that's a three-digit number basically, or three decimal places. So over here we've got six. 
I'm going to square that, and then what am I going to do with that number? Store where? Three. Three. Very good. And then finally, we have 0. 0.0888. Then you got to hit the plus minus key. It's kind of backwards. I'd like to be able to do minus first, and it work that way. And then I'm going to subtract, recall, zero. And I get this number right here. I'm going to square it, and what should I do? Store <laughs> four. Okay, now we have the square deviations for all those things. The next thing that we are going to calculate is called the SSD, which is the sum of the squared deviations. So those things we just came up with were all the devi squared deviations. And now we're going to do the sum of squared deviations. Any idea how we're going to get something called the sum of squared deviations? Yeah, we're going to add all those squared deviations together. So here we go. How we're going to do that is to say, recall one plus recall two plus recall three plus recall four equals. And that's how we get that sum of square deviations. Now, here's for the weird, where the weirdness comes in. So far, we don't have variance, we don't have standard deviation, we're, we're just still making the stuff up to get there. But when you're dealing with, um, when you're dealing with sample data, all you gotta do to get the variance is to take the sum of square deviations and divide by n minus one. Now, if you ask your <laughs> statistics professor, why is it n minus one? By the way, what's n in our situation here? Four, because we've got four different returns, right? If you ask your statistics professor why it's n minus one, They'll tell you because you lost a degree of freedom when you calculated that mean, that average. In other words, we've already used some of the information out of the data set, and so now instead of dividing by four, we're dividing by three. Now, what is a degree of freedom? I can't really explain it, and I have a PhD, right? If you want to know what a degree of freedom is, corner your uh, statistics professor and ask them. I would love to hear their explanation if you manage to get one. Okay, it's a little too complex, but what do you really need to know out of this? That formula right there. And this is, we gotta be careful, this is sample variance. We're talking about the difference between sample and population measures. Sample means that out of this class, I'm going to grab a sample and then make assumptions about the rest of the class. So let's say that I'm going to grab the sample that is the front row. Today, the front row consists of two females, I'm guessing, right? Okay, two females. Now, if I were to draw inferences about the whole class, based on these folks right here, what would I say about the percentage of females in the class? Yeah, I would say it's 100%. Is that true? No. If I wanted to have the whole population of the class, I would have to go around and find out what each one of you, how you identify, right? And so then we could have the whole population. And so as we get, by the way, as we get a greater sample, that n minus 1 actually grows. And so that brings the variance down. So our guesses get better and better as we grow our sample. Does that make sense? OK. So this is sample standard deviation, or sample variance, that we're doing right now. When we get to chapter 11, we're going to be doing work with population variances, and they require a different approach. They start out similar, but then you get different. Okay, now, what is, the, this is, by the way, some of the square deviations, we need to divide by three to get the variance. So that's how we got that number right there. 
Now, for you statistics scholars, can anybody tell me how we're going to jump from variance to standard deviation? Or what button are we going to hit next? Square root. Let's do that. Now we are at 0.2413 or 24.13%. That's the standard deviation. Okay, now how many of you think that you could replicate that on an exam without making a mistake? I don't see any hands at all, which either means that you're, an, oh, one, we got one. If it's just like that, then yes. If it's just like that, you think it's gonna be just like that, okay. Yeah, so there's a procedure to it. You can easily learn it. And when you get to chapter 11, you're gonna see that you kinda of have to. But the good news is right now, I'm gonna show you an easy way to do this with the TI VA2 Plus. Would you like to see the easy way? Oh, very good. Okay, so here's what I want you to do. Clear your calculator and go second. And then seven. Remember, second allows us to grab what's above the button. What does it say above the number seven? <coughs> yeah, it says data. And so that is going to allow us to enter some data. Now, here's what you need to know about the calculator. The calculator is like a wife. It never forgets. So we have to clear out the calculator. Because what if the previous thing we were doing had five data points? Now we're gonna go in there and enter four data points, and that fifth one will hang out there just waiting to give us trouble. And so we want to go ahead and clear it out, and here's how we do that. We hit second, and then the clear button, and that clears out that sheet. Okay, now what we're going to do is put these in as decimals. You could actually put them in as percentages, but then uh, it gives you trouble calculating variance, and I'll show you how to calculate variance. First thing I want to do is say 0.13. Seven, enter. You gotta hit enter or it's like it never even happened. Arrow down. Your calculator is actually, it can compare two sets of returns and that'll be important later on, but not right now. So we're just gonna leave Y's as they are. X02.358, what should I hit next? Enter. Enter, very good. Arrow down. What should I do here? Leave it yeah, leave it alone. Arrow down. <clears throat> what should I put in for X03? Point four five one four. Yeah, point four five one four. Enter. Arrow down. Leave it alone. And then the last one is point oh eight eight eight. Negative. Enter. Phew, okay, now I've got all that stuff in. And what I do next is hit second and the number eight. What does it say above number eight? Oh, come on, someone can read. Stat. Stat, Stat which is short for? Statistics. Statistics, right? Okay, so here it says Lin, which is either a Chinese person's name or it's short for linear, I'm not sure. It doesn't matter. Here's what you need to know. Bless you. You're going to hit the arrow down. And the first thing it's going to tell you is how many things you have in that data. You want to check this because if you forgot to clear that out and then n is greater than the number of things you put in, you know you've got a problem, right? You need to go back and clear some stuff out and try again. Okay, so now we're going to arrow down. What do you think x bar is? Mean. Yeah, it's the mean. And in fact, it's exactly the number that we got when we did it the old fashioned way. You guys recognize that number? Okay, now here's for the really exciting part. <clears throat> Arrow down once more, and we have S sub X. S sub X is the sample standard deviation. Do you recognize that number? Yeah, it's exactly what we got when we did this thing using the pick and blowtorch method, right? Exactly the same thing, but hey, we've done it a lot more quickly here. In fact, we didn't even have to go through variance to get there. The calculator did all that for us. Now, 
What if I ask you instead for variance in this problem, what would you do? To this number right here, what would you do to get variance? Yeah, you're just going to square it. And man, check it out. The only reason this number and this number aren't identical is because I've got one more decimal place here than I do here. That's the only reason why. Which is easier? The first way that I showed you, what I'll call the pick and blowtorch method, or doing it this way? This way. Which way should you practice with the practice problems? This way. Which way should you use on the exam? This way. Does that make sense? Oh, this makes your life so, so, so much easier. Um, back when I was doing pen, uh, pencil and paper, and I get a hold of someone's exam and they've drawn out the table and they've got all this chicken scratch, I'm like, oh, dude, you didn't listen at all, right? It's too, too easy to do it this way. Okay, any questions? Oh, by the way, I'm gonna show you something here. Um, if I wanna get my standard deviation back, I go arrow up and then back arrow down, and now we're back. You can tell that it's something the calculator uh, computed if it has the equal sign. If it doesn't have the equal sign, it's something you've done. And then the next thing I want to show you is this number right here. This is population standard deviation. Don't, 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 don't use this. Don't, 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 don't use this. Don't. Now, when I was a little kid, my mom says, don't touch the stove. I said, why? She says, it's hot. I said, so? She says, it'll burn your hand. I said, okay. What do you think I did as soon as she turned around? All right? You think I learned things the hard way? That, yeah. Some of you are gonna do that. I have no idea why. I don't know. And then you come to my office and you'll ask why you got it wrong. And we'll have a long talk about don't, 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 right? We're looking at sample standard deviation here. We're looking at a sample of data. So you want to use S sub X. This is like a sigma sub X, lowercase sigma, I think it is. Okay, questions? And just in case you miss out, you can go to, by the way, I've got this on my online class, but you can also go to this YouTube and watch it there. Now, we mentioned a little bit last time about the normal distribution. Another name you've heard for the normal distribution is the bell curve. And the normal distribution, a lot of people totally misunderstand what it's all about. Um, people that come out of my class will say, oh, that's about stock returns. But actually, it's about lots and lots of things. For instance, if we looked at the heights of people, how tall they are, that might be normally distributed if we look at uh, lots of natural processes, um, so for instance, strength tests on materials, we come out with a normal distribution. And the normal distribution is just defined by two numbers. Does anyone remember what they are? One of them's real easy. Yeah, the mean and standard deviation. And in fact, you can see here, forget the those return numbers down on the bottom. The mean is at zero, and then we have plus or minus one standard deviation, plus or minus two standard deviations, and plus or minus three standard deviations. Now, what is this thing useful for? It's useful for um, calculating probabilities. For instance, I could tell you that between uh, negative one standard deviation and positive one standard deviation, you're gonna find 68.26% of the observations. And it doesn't matter whether it's stock returns or anything that's normally distributed, it's gonna be the same way. And I could tell you between plus and minus two standard deviations, we're gonna have 95.44%. And between plus and minus three standard deviations, we're gonna have 99.74%. Okay, now, instead of going straight into stock returns, I'm going to use an example from the real world, and it's uh, IQ. Do you guys know what IQ is? It's a measure of what? Yeah, intelligence. It's called the intelligence quotient, and the average of this thing is, by design, 100. 
So the average is 100. Most people know that. What most people don't realize, though, is that the standard deviation is 15. And so what that allows me to tell you is that 68.26% of the population, we expect to have an IQ between 85 and 115. How did I get 85 and 115? How did I calculate 85? Yeah, 100 minus 15 gave me the minus 1 standard deviation of about 85. What about plus 1 standard deviations? 100 plus 15 gives me 115. So that is 68.26%. That's more than two-thirds of the population is between 85 and 115. Now, what if we were to look at plus or minus 2 standard deviations? Well, what would minus 2 standard deviations be? 100 minus 2 times 15 is? So two, two standard deviations would be 30. So 100 minus 30 would be? 70. Yeah, very good, 70. And 100 plus 30 would be? 130. Now, it turns out that they actually use these standard deviations to come up with clinical terms to describe people's intelligence. And uh, there is a term that we're not allowed to use anymore. It starts with an R. But it's just a clinical diagnosis of two standard deviations or more lower than the mean. And so the IQ for those folks, which we call developmentally or cognitively challenged, I forget what the new word is, but it's just people that are 70 or below. Does that make sense? Now, on the other end, I believe that the term for people over 130 is, I think they call it gifted or something like that. So they use these standard deviations to break things down. Now, what if we go a little further than that? What if we go to plus three standard deviations? Now we're an IQ of 145. What do we call people like that? Geniuses. Now, let's ask a question here. What percentage of the population are geniuses? How would we go about figuring that out? Well, the first thing is we need to figure out how many standard deviations we are away from the mean. And you'll see, so we use T for samples and stuff like So that's, you can either, and sometimes you'll see Z. Either way, it's the same idea. It's X minus X bar divided by S sub X. And so X in this case would be our IQ of 145. What do we say the average IQ is? 100. And then we divide by the standard deviation of IQ. What do we say that is? 15. So I get 45 over 15, which gives me 3. So I'm plus 3 standard deviations away. And so I know where that puts me on this chart. It puts me right here. Now we know that there are 99.74% of the observations between plus 3 and minus 3. What does that mean for what's outside plus 3 minus 3? Yeah, so it's 0.26%. How'd you get that? Yeah, 100% minus 99.74% gives us 0.26%. Now, the next thing you need to know about the normal distribution is that it is symmetric. What does symmetric mean? Same on both sides, right? And so what that tells us is that that 0.26% is spread out evenly over those tails. Does that make sense? And so if I were to ask you how much of that is above plus three standard deviations, how much would it be? Yeah, 0.13%. Okay, so let's run a little experiment here. You've just been tested. Your IQ is 145. You're a genius, congratulations. Do you feel good about yourself? Yeah, you should, right? Okay, now, uh, let's do a little experiment. That means that only 0.13% uh, of the population is smarter than you. So let's go clear, 
point oh oh one three. I'm going to use a decimal form here, and then we're going to multiply it by. Uh, I think it's I think it's eight now. Eight one two three one two three. That's eight billion. How many people in the world are smarter than you? Uh, is that right? Let's try that again. Yeah, I think so. There we go. Oh yeah, there we go. 10.4 million people in the world smarter than you. Do you still feel special? No. Now the good news is that uh, probably a third to a half of those people are in a part of Asia or Africa or someplace where they don't have access to electricity and internet. So you don't have to worry about competing with them. So there is some light at the end of the tunnel there, right? Okay. Now, what we're using here is the normal distribution to figure out probabilities, multiplying the probability times the population to give us the, the number in the population, to kind of give us an idea of how many people are in these different pieces. Now, let's take this and turn it towards stock returns. And, and I'm going to walk through some more of these calculations with you once we get to the stock returns. Just looking at this picture, can anybody tell me what is the mean return on the stocks that we're looking at here? Yeah, it's 11.8%. How did you know? It's in the middle. Yeah, she's absolutely right. So the mean's always in the middle. That's your tent pole. Now, let's take a look at trying to figure out what is the standard deviation. What Can anybody tell me what the standard deviation is here? 20.5. How'd you get that? Yeah, 32.3 minus 11.8, because she knows that 32.3 is plus one standard deviation. Does that make sense? And we could check her work. 11.8 minus 20.5 should give us negative 8.7%, and it does. And so now we have the mean and the standard deviation for these stocks. Now let's ask some questions. But I'm going to go ahead and write that down because my memory isn't what it used to be. So the mean is 11.8%. And the sample standard deviation is 20.5%. Is that correct? Okay. Now, if I were to ask you what is between 32.3% and 8, negative 8.7%, what percentage of observations are there, what would you tell me? Oh, come on. You can just look at the... Look at the board and figure this one out, right? What's between, so that represents plus and one, minus one standard deviation. How do I know? Well, let's go back to our T over here. The first number I gave you was 32.3 minus 11.8 um, divided by the standard deviation of 20.5. That gives us one, right? So that's plus one standard deviation. And we could do the minus one the same way. In fact, let's go ahead and do that. The minus one side is minus 8.7% minus 11.8% divided by 20.5. And that gives me minus 20.5 divided by 20.5, which is minus one. So we know we are looking at plus or minus one standard deviations. How, what percentage of observations are between plus and minus one? 68.26. By the way, um, for homework and for exams, we tend to use some approximations. And the first approximation is plus or minus one standard deviation and it's 68%. By the way, I'm a lousy artist. 
The next one's plus or minus two, and we use 95%. And so far, this makes sense. If I round 68.126 down, I get 68%. If I round 95.44%, what do I get? 95%. If I round 99.74% to the nearest percentage, what do I get? 100 percent that's no fun it doesn't leave any of the tail for us to play with right so we gotta we gotta kind of cheat here on this this third one and we're going to call plus or minus three 99 percent so we'll still have something for you guys to do calculations with oh. so should you have this on your note sheet Absolutely, you should, because when it comes time and you're looking at a question that says, what's the probability of losing more than da 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 you're going to need to calculate the mean, the standard deviation, which I've already showed you how to do on your calculator, really easy. And then you're going to need to know how to use this thing, plus you're going to need the numbers. I was given this material on an exam to a China EMBA class. And there was one lady in there from Inner Mongolia. And she raised her hand during the exam. And I went up to her and she pointed at a problem like this. And she said, you didn't give me all the information I need to solve this problem. And she had her note sheet right there with that very picture on it. And I said, <clears throat> yes, I did. She said, no, you didn't. I said, yes, I did. I'm pointing straight at it. She says, no, you didn't. And she actually reaches out to grab my lapels. I was younger and quicker then. I was able to jump back before she got a hold of me and pulled me over the table. Now she came by my office later, and we talked about it. We're friends now. We're on WeChat together. This has been years ago. But anyway, so my, my point to you, why do I tell you that story? Well, first of all, it's kind of fun. Secondly, it's to remind you that when you see these problems with probability, you're like, I don't know how to do that. Think about the normal distribution. You actually do know how to do that. And you're going to need your mean, you're going to need your standard deviation, and you're going to need those approximations. Does that make sense? Okay. So let's, let's run some examples here of, of ways this could be uh, used. What is the probability that you'll get at least 52.8% return in any given year. Let me say that again. What's the probability that you're going to get at least 52.8% in any given year? Well, what am I going to do? Uh, I'm going to go, I uh, see 52.8% right here. And so what portion of the normal distribution am I talking about? Well, when I say I'm going to get at least 52.8%, it means we're looking out here, right? And so what I really need to do is figure out, ah, back. What I really need to do is figure out what's hanging out here. Now, how am I going to do that? I'm going to start with this formula right here. It equals 52.8 minus 11.8 divided by 20.5. So that is equal to 51 over 20.5, or no, actually 41, sorry, 41. And so that's going to give us two, plus two. So now I know I'm two standard deviations above the mean. We know that we have 95, and we're gonna keep using the exact numbers here in class, uh, but now let's use the, the, uh, the approximations to make life easier. We know that 95% are between plus and minus 2. What does that mean is in that tail out beyond plus 2? Uh, yeah, 2.5%. So 5% is outside of plus or minus 2, but we have to divide that by 2 because only half of that is over here. The other half is over here. And so we would say that the probability of having a return of at least 52.8% would be 2.5%. Now, if you did it out with 95.44%, you'll come up with a slightly different number. 
I will not put both of those on the exam as different choices. That's just cruel, right? So if you do it one way and the number's a little different, it's probably because of the difference between the exact and the approximation. But I will never make the answers so close that you won't be able to know what you're looking at. Okay. Question. So for the exam, we, it's, we should be working like that. Yeah, I, I have worked diligently to get the exam on this right here. Now, I'm not perfect. Occasionally <laughs> things slip through. But even if they do, you're prepared now, right? Okay, questions? Okay, now, what if I say, what is the probability I will not lose more than 8.7%? What is the probability I won't lose more than 8.7%? The first thing I want you to know is that lose is negative. Does that make sense? So we're looking at negative 8.7% minus our mean of 11.8% divide by our standard deviation of 20.5%. Minus 8.7 minus 11.8 is minus 20.5. Divide by 20.5 is equal to negative 1. We're looking at negative 1 standard deviation. Now, I said, what is the probability I will not lose more than 8.7%. Where am I looking at? Which side of that 8.7% should I be looking at? Should I be looking this way or should I be looking this way? Yeah, I want to look over here. And the reason I want to do that is because I don't want to lose more than. If I had said, what's the probability you will lose more than 8.7%, we would have started at 8.7% and gone that way. Does that make sense? Okay, now there's a couple ways to go about this. Um, we know, here's something cool that we know about this thing. Remember I said that it's symmetric? Do you remember what percentage of observations are underneath the normal distribution? It's not a trick question. 100%, right? And so what does that mean percentage-wise? What, how much percentage is in each half? 50. And so we know that from 11.8% on out to infinity is 50%. Now we need to know what's between 11.8 and minus 8.7%. Well, if we know plus or minus one standard deviation is 68.26%, what does that mean is between the mean and minus one standard deviation? 34.13%, does that make sense? Okay, now, so what is the answer to our question? The probability that you will not lose more than 8.7% is 50% plus 34.13, which is 84.13%. That's one way to get it. Another way to get it would be to figure out what is in this pail over here and subtract it from 100%. So let's do that. We know that everything outside of there is 32.74%. You see that? 32.74%. So and let's make sure, no, no, 31, sorry. Let's make sure I'm getting my numbers right here. 100 minus 68.26 is 31.474%. Okay, so what does that mean is in this tail over here? Half of it, very good. So now we're at 15.87%. So in order to find out what's on, what the rest of this thing is, I'm going to put a minus on that and do that get exactly the same number. So I could either take the 50% here and then add this little piece, 34.13, or I could figure out what this is and then subtract it from 100. And I think I just killed up my calculator. I hate that. Okay. 
Hey, it's back. Okay. Now, what is the probability that I will not earn more than 32.3%? So if I ask what's the probability I will have more than 32.3%, it would be starting at 32.3 and going to the right. But instead, we're going the other way, right? So the probability that I will not make more than 32.3%, we know that we have 50% coming up to the mean, and then because we're plus or minus one, someone from the plus or minus one standard deviation at 68.26%, we know there's 34, or yeah, 34.13% between zero and positive one. And so once again, the probability is 84.13%. We could do exactly the same thing. In fact, this is just the mirror image of the problem that we just worked. Does that make sense? Okay, now. I have an entire video where I walk through example after example after example on this. I guarantee you, you will not get it from today's lecture, simply because this really messes with people's heads. So what I want you to do before you try the practice problems, before you try the uh, homework, I want you to go and I want you to watch those examples. You guys know where to find the example videos on Blackboard? If you don't, ask a friend that knows. Okay. Anything else on the normal distribution before we move on? So now let's talk about arithmetic versus geometric average. So arithmetic average is the one you know and love. It's the one your grandma, your mom, your dad, they're all quite familiar with. And that's just where we add up the number of items and divide by the number. We add up all the items and divide by the number of items. So it's pretty easy. The one you haven't probably heard of is the geometric average. And oh my goodness, it's quite a bit more complicated. Um, and we're going to be talking about average or uh, returns here. And so those R1, R2, R3, and so forth in, in the geometric average formula, they have to be in decimals. Go ahead and write that down. The returns have to be in decimals in geometric average because we're adding them to 1. So a 5% return would give us 1.05. Now, arithmetic average, you could go either way. It doesn't care. It could be percentages, it could be decimals, it just doesn't care. Okay, so on this geometric average, what we're going to do is we're going to take, we're going to add 1 to all of our returns. And then we're going to multiply all those together. And then, we're, and by the way, we could have up to n of these. So let's say we've got our previous example, we had 4, so n would be 4. And so we would have 1 plus r1 times 1 plus r2 times 1 plus r3 times 1 plus r4. And then I would take that product to the 1 over n power. And I'll show you how to do that on a calculator, to the 1 over n power. And then you remember how I added 1 to all those returns to start out with? Now I'm going to subtract 1. And then if I want it in percentage, I multiply by 100%. Does that sound a whole lot more complicated than what we did earlier with just adding this stuff together? Yeah, absolutely it is. So there must be a reason that we mess around with this thing. So here's the example. Your portfolio at uh, time zero is worth $100. Now in order to figure a return, we know that you have to have a prior period data. Remember it's P t plus 1 minus p sub t divided by p sub t. Well, we don't have the prior period data, and so there's no way we can calculate a return for that. That's time 0. Then at time 1, the value is down to 50. So 50 minus 100 divided by, let's see, 50 minus 100 divided by 100 is equal to negative 
0.5. You guys see that? It's negative 50 divided by 100, so it's negative 0.5. Okay, now, time period two, we're up to 75. 75 minus the prior period value, 50, divided by 50 is going to give us plus 0.5. What is the arithmetic mean? What is the arithmetic average for this portfolio over those two years? Well, it's 0.5 minus 0.5. Zero. What's zero divided by two? Zero, right? And so you say, well, wait a minute. That's, that's great. We haven't lost anything. That doesn't sound right, though, because we went from 100 down to 75. And so we know that arithmetic average isn't telling us the whole story. And the reason the arithmetic average is a little flawed for our purposes is it doesn't take compounding into effect. It doesn't take compounding into effect. If you managed to pay attention when you were reviewing Chapter 4, you know that compounding is the earning of interest on interest. And so it's basically... The, the collection of these changes in value over time. So if you're now making a great return, but on a smaller portfolio, that's going to impact the real amount of money that you have at the end. That's compounding. Okay, so let's go ahead and do the geometric average, and we're going to use our calculator to do this. So get your calculator out. So one plus R1 would be one, plus 0.5 negative equals. So it's a positive 0.5. Then I'm going to multiply by open parentheses 1 plus 0.5 close parentheses equals. So 1 plus R1 times 1 plus R2 is 0.75. The next step in the formula says to take it to the 1 over n power. Here's how I'm going to do that. Do you see the button right above the number 9? It says y to the x. We're going to open parentheses. We're going to say 1 divided by n. What's n in this case? 2. Close parentheses. Equal. So I'm getting 0.866. Just doing some other stuff. Now, there's another step in the formula. I have to subtract 1 and then multiply by 100 to get that in the percentage. And so my geometric average return is minus 13.397, which means we lost money. And that makes sense. In fact, if I looked at this thing, I could come up with a rough guess of what this thing was going to be because it went from 100 down to 75, which is a drop of 25 over two years. So I know it's going to be greater than 12 and a half percent negative. I, I should say it's going to have a greater magnitude, right? It's going to be lower than minus 12 and a half percent. Okay, so you say, well, wait a minute. How can we prove that that's actually what's going on? Let's go back and use our uh, TIBA2 plus second clear TVM. At the end, the value is 75. We're going to put that in as the future value. At the beginning, it was 100 negative present value. And we're going to put in 2 for n. And we're going to compute i for y. It's the same number. It's the same number. And so this geometric average, come on, geometric average takes into account that compounding. And so or should we throw arithmetic average out the window? Absolutely not. All these statistical things that we're going to do where we subtract the average to get like standard deviation, things like that, they all use arithmetic means. So don't throw it out the window. They answer different questions. So the, ad, the arithmetic average answers this question. What was your return in an average year over a particular period? And so 0% would be the correct answer. In an average year, it's zero, but it doesn't talk to us about the whole period. So 
the geometric average answers this question, what was your compound return per year over a particular period? And it's pro, so I won't go to that next part yet. So what is your average compound per year over a particular period? And so it makes sense what we just talked about would be correct for that. Now, we say that arithmetic average is probably too high for longer periods. And the geometric is probably too low for shorter periods. Let's talk about the high low first. If you have, if you're figuring arithmetic return and geometric return, the arithmetic return will always be greater than or equal to the geometric return. The arithmetic return will always be greater than or equal to. The only way that they're equal is if the standard deviation is zero. For instance, if I had 8%, 8%, 8%, 8%, 8%, then I would have both an arithmetic mean and a geometric mean of 8%. But if I had 6%, 10%, 6%, 10%, 6%, 10%, my arithmetic mean would still be 8%, but my geometric mean is going to be something lower. Let me prove it to you. One point oh six times one point one oh times one point oh six times one point one oh times one point oh six times one point one oh. Now I had six returns I put in there, so I'm going to say uh, y to the x one divide by six close parentheses, equals minus 1 times 100. And so it is less than 8%. The geometric average will never be greater than the arithmetic average. And so one of the things we say is that the arithmetic average may give you a value that's too high for what's really going on. So our portfolio, for sure, arithmetic average gave us a value that was too high for what's really going on geometric average can, can do the opposite to you. Now, here's a fun thing. Um, if you go back to the financial crisis, so uh, S&P 500, let's say it lost 30%. And then uh, a few years later, I'm watching, and there is this CNBC news anchor. You guys know about CNBC? It's business television. And the lady that's talking about it, she says, well, you know, the S&P was down 30%. And now it's up 30%, so we're back where we started. Was she right? Let's just use some real simple numbers. If at the beginning of the crisis it was 100, if you go down 30%, now you're down to how much? 70. Now, if we go up 30%, what's 30% of 70? You guys can't do this in your head? Or it's, it's 21. So 70 plus 21, now we're up to 91. We're still down 9%. We went down 30%, we went up 30%, and we're still down 9%. So that let me know that she was unfamiliar with like mathematics. <laughs> um, she probably went to journalism school instead of business school, but hey, God bless her. Okay, back to the story. That's the, that's the problem we're trying to address with this geometric return versus the arithmetic. Does that make sense? Now, as far as that other part, where it says longer periods and shorter periods. You know, if I were you, I would just have that on your note sheet. <laughs> if you want to have a really, really, really deep understanding of that, I have posted an academic paper in the folder for this material. And you can read that and get a deeper understanding of that if you're so inclined. I'm not going to give you an essay question asking you to explain it. 